Um, welcome to a push start webinar. Stu's going to take us through uh, the profit and loss statement and how it pertains to our business, how we can have it set up and its relative importance in, um, in steering and guiding your business into the upper echelons of success, right? So I'm going to let Stu take it away. I'm going to fade out that music. You guys keep uh, putting comments in. I'll also have a Q&A going. You can put the questions in the chat and I'll catch it or uh, you can put it in the Q&A. Either way, we'll save those for the end because there will be a time to go over all the questions and answer them. So Stu, cool. Welcome. thanks for doing this. And uh, absolutely, take it away. Always a good time. All righty, guys. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna geek out on some numbers stuff. I and just for prerequisite, I'm not intrinsically a numbers guy. I had a tutor in grade school for math. I had an algebra tutor. I did horrible in the math section of my SATs. I am not good at math minus barbell math. If you roll a barbell to me, I can in two seconds. I whatever the plate configuration is, I know exactly the weight, but I'm not good at the numbers. And I will say, in my decade that I owned my gym. It was the time in which I dedicated getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. We all like using that line, right? And I got comfortable with the numbers and the PL is pretty much where I started and ended. Um, eventually got into like a balance sheet, but the PL for most of us is going to be the one stop shop to get a unbiased view of how our business is doing. So um, I like numbers because we can always feel emotional as to why things happen and what they were, but numbers are just black and white. It just is what it is. So we're going to be talking about that today. Um, and I just want to go share Zach. It says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Am I sharing? a? I didn't think, I didn't, I don't think you were sharing. Oh, it's because I'm sharing. I'm, I'm sharing my audio. Oh, oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Let me, uh, how do I end my share of the audio? Mm, don't have an option to do that. Anybody know how to stop sharing audio if that little thing is not up? I didn't even know you could share just audio. Um, yeah, I'm learning all this stuff. Ben, do you know how to stop uh, sharing audio? You're, you're good at this stuff. Maybe if I just exit that out. Cool, now try and share. Bingo. Yep. Always go. something. There we go. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Okay. Everybody, um, everyone can see we're all good. You got me, Zach? Yeah, I got you. All right. Demystifying your PL, your profit and loss statement, guys. So before we get into the profit loss statement, all the out, I just want to do just the basic math. I think when we start here and we just kind of understand essentially what we're looking at with a PL, it'll help. There's generally a lot of financial terms that are all synonymous with each other. And what I'm going to show you next, you'll probably maybe have other terms you use maybe personally in it, but these are the general ones you'll see on any pretty much standard P&L, profit and loss. All right. So at the beginning, when we look at a P&L, if I were in layman's terms, it essentially shows you how much money you make and how much does it cost you to make that money. Whatever's left over is what we call net profit, all right, or, or profit. So that's essentially, if you think of a PL, it's going to break down in this exact order. At the very top of a PL, and I'm going to show you examples of PLs here in a second, you're going to have your revenue or your income. All right. That is just what the monies you made from services and products. Pretty simple, right? So that's another like top line. Everyone has ever asked you, hey, what's the, what does your business do? Top line. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Now we start taking away from that. Now, if you have direct cost associated with those services or products, so for example, if I sell these calculators, okay, and every one of these calculators has a very direct cost from the manufacturer, so I sell them for 20 bucks, but everyone has a hard line cost, it's never, never changes of $6.50, that would be COGS, cost of goods sold. When you look at gyms and I look at P&Ls that have COGS in them, you're generally looking at their retail department. So you bought a fit aid for a dot for a dollar 10, you sold it for three fifteen. The cogs would be the dollar 10, the cost of that fit aid at wholesale. Okay. So when you subtract your cogs from your revenue or income, you get your gross profit from there. Your P and L will then minus your OPEX, your operating expenses. These are costs that are not directly linked to the actual service of product. They're you know, 
auxiliary. They could be things like um, your utility bills, your push press subscription. If you have a, uh, if you go, you know, apparel that you buy for coaches to wear, all those random things, your, if your car payment is wrapped up within the business, these are all OPEX, your rent, any loan payments, things like that, anything cost of the business, we take that out and then that would give us net profit, okay? So at the very basic level, this is a math equation that every p &L performs and it's just gonna do so in a very summarized way. Now, let's take a look at an example of that. So at the very top line here, and I, do I have a little annotator? Nope, I don't have any way to do that. But at the very top here, you'll see income, all right? It's gonna go ahead and break that income down. Now, your income is broken down through your bookkeeping software. I'll talk to you about how do you get a PL. You're gonna need to use most popular QuickBooks, or for those of you guys, especially outside of the US, Zero is another popular bookkeeping software. It syncs up to your bank accounts. It pulls in every dollar that goes into the account and every dollar that goes out. And then you categorize it on the back end and you will get reports and many other potential reports like this. But this particular gym has gone ahead and it has categorized its revenue. It categorizes the revenue that's coming in from membership. It has categorized the revenue coming in from merchandise and then what other, whatever other means. Okay. And then it gives us total income, just like we talked about it in the previous slide. Then there's sales, and it has gone ahead and categorized the cost of sales, so their version of COGS here. And then all the other random stuff, payroll, advertising, education and training, insurance. These are all generic categories within your bookkeeping software. Now, you can customize these. You literally could have a line item in there for push press, right? In here, it would probably say something like software, but you can create a specific line item for push press. And that way you can keep track of how much you get charged for push press every single month throughout the duration of your business and see, you know, hey, push press is 0.0001% of my expenses. It's pretty good. It's worth it, right? So you can customize your PL to look however you like. You can give them your categories, unique names, all that. And then it'll give us a total OPEX. And then obviously when we subtract that, we get that net profit or you'll hear net operating profit. It's all synonymous for the same thing. But at a glance, this is a very basic version of p &L. We'll get into a more advanced one here in a second. Now with your p &L, I just want you to remember and be thinking about this. This is just like a financial report card. It is a document that if you are leasing a building, going to get a loan, you, or maybe you currently have a loan and they want you to, you know, a lot of loans will want quarterly p &Ls and financial reports. These things will be required. If you're ever working with a consultant or a mentor and they want to understand how your business is doing, no offense, guys, but you know, I, I don't know who it was, which rapper, but men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie, right? Or uh, Ben Franklin, I think it was like, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. Anecdotally, whenever I'm working with a gym owner, I'm like, hey, how was last month? And they tell me, I'm like, that's cool. I'm not calling you a liar. I just don't, I don't care. I want to see a PL. I need to see the numbers because we as business owners can tell ourselves stories as to why numbers were up or down and we could change like, well, I think I did 24,000 last month. Really it was 21.3. And that, that is a big, that's a significant difference. So we want to make sure that these PLs are a part of what you're using for yourself. It's a great way for you to, you know, objectively look at your business, but allows other people as well. Um, some of the things I really like using a PL for down here, revenue and expense fluctuations. Right. What's coming up, uh, Zach? What 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 fun functional fitness event is are a lot of people gearing up for? I think we got like the 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 world's fittest competition or something. What do they call yeah. that? Games or something? So it's my like favorite <laughs> my favorite part of looking at a CrossFit gym uh, is PNL. Is it's like the five weeks of the open, crazy extra expenses as they're throwing fun parties and Friday night lights, and then there's always this spike, and it's like meals and entertainment and travel. And I'm like, oh, you spent four and a half grand going to Madison this year for the for the CrossFit games. I you know, and it's you know, it gets categorized in there because the money, you can't hide the money if you're using the business account to pay for it. So I like seeing it for fluctuations and expenses. You can kind of see, oh crap, we're going to the CrossFit Games every year. We better save up or cut down on our expenses prior to that. Um, your ability to control costs. Everyone asks, you know, what's the What's the difference between a gym doing, you know, 30,000 a month and a gym doing 90,000 a month? The gym, besides the extra 60, 
It's the gym that does the 90 and does it well, controls cost along the way. Because a lot of gyms for every, you know, $10,000 in extra revenue they make, it costs them an extra five or 6,000 to make it. So like if your revenue always grows with your expenses, you'll be one of those, I make, uh, you know, I make 500K a year, but it costs me 400K to 410 to make it. It's not, not the most impressive thing in the world for a small brick and mortar business. So your ability to control costs is done by the p and um, Understand which costs impact profit more than others. There are some things that hit your profit line harder. Generally things like payroll, rent are your two biggest line items. And then understand the difference between being able to generate a lot of revenue versus profit, right? The what do you bench of, uh, we'll talk about, of, uh, of financial talk amongst business owners. Hey, how much money, you, how much money did you do last year? Right. That used to be like the what do you bench between gym owners? Um, I also believe asking you what your profit is is also a what do you bench? It's a very broad, misunderstood term, but we'll talk about that here. Um, but, it, you know, it, it just allows you to kind of see I generated a lot of money, but I didn't walk away with a lot. Why was that? And then you get to establish a financial model, which we've talked about in multiple push press courses or push start courses, apologize, um, which is just the financial model is how your money is allocated. So if $100,000 comes in each year, where does it all go? Now, how do you get your PL? Like I said, you essentially connect bookkeeping software to your business bank account, right? So up here at the top, people give you money. That money goes into your bank. Then you connect your bank to generally one of these two. There's other ones as well, but these are the most popular uh, bookkeeping softwares. And then those softwares create numerous reports. If you are fortunate enough to have a bookkeeper who does your reconciliations or your categorization of the money you make and the money you spend for you, awesome. If you're doing it yourself, then you, like me, when I first started, you probably realize the pain in the butt it is when you forget to do your organization and your reconciliations for like 90 days. And you're like, oh, Christ, now I got to go back and do three months worth of organizing all my expenses and the money I made and put into the different categories. So you can do your bookkeeping on your own. You just have to be diligent with doing it on a weekly or monthly basis. Now, a few things are not included in a P&L. Now, I say that with an asterisk because you can customize the bookkeeping software to pretty much have anything in it you want. I have seen things in a PL that historically wouldn't be. And some of those things that standardize, the most standard PLs that you will not see and take an account here owner contributions. So let's say your business operated at a loss one month. You spent more money than you made. Well, where are you getting the extra money from? Unless you have some kind of reserves. A lot of us, I know I did this when I first started, I had to take my own personal money and loan it to my business and just transfer from personal checking to business checking to cover payroll, okay? That is an owner contribution. That would not show up in a P&L, okay? Now you can go in there because it might show up in there as additional income and revenue, and you might wanna go in there and reorganize that, but a owner distribution is not something we, or a contribution is not normally something we see distributions are also not something you see in there. So if you are a business who pays yourself in distributions, meaning you transfer money from your business checking to your personal. So this is not W2s. You are not, this is not a salary that has taxes taken out of it and payroll wages. This is just a straight transfer of leftover profit in the business to yourself. That is a distribution to the owner. Those are generally not showing up in a PL either. Loan repayments, um, I per like I, a lot of the PLs I look at actually will have a line item in there for bank and note repayments um, that they are making on there. But traditionally, when you first turn on a PL and you get all your basic categories, you may not see that. Um, other investments, if you if you're spending cash and you know uh, you're kicking it over to the stock market or you have rental homes, you wouldn't see that in there. And then state and federal taxes are not included in a PL either. Okay, this PL again, it's how much money did I make? How much did it cost for me to make it? Whatever's left over is that net profit or net income. All right, let's review a PL. This is a uh, a mock PL. Um, and I this is one that you know would look pretty probably similar to most of ours. And as you can tell, this is way more advanced than the previous version, a lot more lines. And some PLs I've seen three times as long as this. The rows just keep going, going, and going, and going. Um, 
But as you can see, again, everything's the same. At the very top line, we have income. For this particular gym, service, they just categorize all the memberships they sell as services, and it's showing what they're doing monthly right here in the top, okay? Now, that because there is no COGS here, there's no cost of goods sold being allocated, the income there is going to go ahead and equal the total income, and the total income is going to equal the gross profit. If you remember back to that first slide, it would have been income minus cost of goods sold. That gives you gross profit. This business, and this is honestly how I prefer, I don't like COGS for service-based businesses. I think it's silly. I think any cost for your wholesale goods, your retail goods should just go as an expense line item because generally we're not, sell we're not selling the exact same amount of fit aids and waters and t-shirts every month. So I don't understand why we would look at it as cost of goods sold. However, I have lots of colleagues and friends that are bookkeepers and CPAs and they work with gyms. And they have a line item for COGS. It's all, again, you can customize your P&L however you'd like, because at the end of the day, it's just going to show this amount of money went into your bank account, this amount of money left your bank account for these reasons, and this is what was left over, if anything, okay? Now we have all of our expenses breaking down, advertising and marketing, auto, if you run a car, something through there, you know, like, you know, some people don't run their car through the business. And I will talk about reasons why and why not to do that in a second. Um, bank charges and fees, any 1099 contractors, interest that you're paying on any loans, anything like that, legal and professional services, uh, meals and entertainment. And this is one, again, we always kind of, well, me, you know, me and a bunch of members, we went out on Saturday night and I had a bucket of beers and a burger and, you know, it's, well, let's label that as, let's use the business card and use that as meals and entertainment, um, which again, which is the IRS would say that is legal and fine because you were out with customers. You could, that you could pass that off perfectly fine. Um, merchant fees off supplies, payroll expenses. This is one of the, fa my favorite ones. This is where you can start learning about with the difference in classifications between 1099s and W-2s because 1099 contractors cost you far less in taxes than W-2 salaried employees or any kind of payment to a W-2. Um, you just have to be very, very careful on the classifications uh, based on your state and based on the risk tolerance of your CPA and your risk tolerance. Total payroll expenses get broken down. And then you might, you know, little things like this, like QuickBook payments fees. That was, that's one that's broken out specifically right in through here. QuickBooks does that because they want you to see how little you're actually having to pay for it. Um, rent and lease, if you're paying rent, travel, if you're, you know, using your business card to fl fly rental cars, whatever, go to the games, utilities. And then we get total expenses, all right? Total expenses here, which again gives us a net operating income. Okay. From there, if there's any interest earned or anything like that in some kind of an account, a lot of us have like that business savings account that rounds up or something and takes the extra and puts it into, that's probably what that's showing right there. And then you have your net income. So you can kind of see this is what the business walks away with in net income at the end. So in this example, they made $340,000, $340,000 and change. It cost them uh, 130, I'm sorry, it cost them 208 thousand dollars to make 340. So that means they got to keep $132,000, right? Not bad. Not bad for that gym. Now, when you, this is again, another way you'll see a PL broken down like this, very similar to everything we just looked at. Okay. Just a few things. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to reiterate everything I, I've already said, but I do want to make sure you guys realize a few things with your PL. If you want to make it the easiest to understand, Use tags within your bookkeeping software. You can tag certain revenues as retail, as memberships, as personal training. So when that money comes in, you would tag it like, oh, that $3,000, you know, transaction from Stripe, that was from a, you know, a whatever, a six-month personal training package I sold. I'm going to tag that as personal training and will allow you at the end of the year to really see this broken out. Now, with awesome software like PushPress, you'll be able to see the kind of the portfolio of your revenue, what it's made up of anyway. But this helps you from, again, if you ever had to show this to a bank because you wanted to get a loan or a landlord because you were convincing them that you were going to be able to afford his rent at this new location. It just also, I like this personally. I like looking at this 
every month I look at a PL of my businesses because I like to have a very, I want someone to tell me the hard line facts. Your business sucked this month, Stu. And that's what a PL does. Or, hey, you did really well. It takes all the emotion out of it. Expenses, right? Now, again, the one thing I'll talk about here, we already mentioned it, but cost of goods sold. I, I generally don't recommend people run with that. If your bookkeeper likes to, you can. Um, only Again, only because the cost of goods sold is generally not consistent. It's just not for a service-based business. For product-based businesses, it is. One thing that's interesting is OPEX versus payroll expenses, right? So I look at these as two different. So in a PL, it will categorize every expense together, even payroll. I like to make sure that I have, you see how it has here bolded out total payroll expenses. I like to know that number. I like to know what percentage of my revenue is going to payroll. And if you've taken the financial models course inside of Push Start, you'll know that that is one of the categories we recommend you break out when you are creating your financial model. What percentage of your revenue goes to payroll? Okay. If you're a gym that has 50, 60 or more percent going to payroll, you are going to have a very hard time making enough money for you. Your staff's definitely making probably enough money um, and for enough money for there to be profit left over. Okay, so it's it's nice to see what that breakout is: operating expenses versus payroll, and then net income. Again, what's left over, and this can be a loss. That's why it's called a profit and loss. You can't operate a loss, and it is not always a bad thing to operate a loss. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is pretty much math. There's really nothing to evaluate. It's just did I make money? Did I lose money? If I made money, did I make more money than this time last year? Why, oh, why? You ever see a why, oh, why report that's a year over year? And your PL will show you year over year, month over month updates. Are you doing better or worse? And that's always one of my favorite things to see on my QuickBooks report. How am I doing year over year? Am I improving? Um, but net, yeah, the net uh, net income is pretty much it's just, it's just subtraction at that point. It's what's left over. Now, I talked about it's not always a bad thing to show a loss. And, and everyone's like, whoa, 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 I thought you want to have profit in your business. You can, you don't have to. Um, and let's talk about that. So why would a business want to show higher or lower profit purposely? And this is one of the things when I thought of demystifying a PL, I can't stand when people look at it like, oh yeah, but look at this, he doesn't have any profit. They suck. That's not true at all. I purposely for years ran my business at a razor thin margin, but I had a very good reason to do so. And I'll talk about it in a second. So reasons to show low profit. Why would you want to do this? Okay. Well, let's say it's in the early stages of your business and your accountant, your CPA and you have said, Hey, we're going to try to, we're going to um, execute a tax strategy where we're going to write off as much as we can. We have a lot of expenses in the first few years. We just set up this brand new location, a lot of new equipment. We're doing a lot of marketing. Let's look to operate at a loss to significantly lower your tax burden. Okay. So that is a reason to operate at a loss, okay? You also could accept, hey, I'm going to be operating at a loss because I'm, in, I'm making significant investments into the business. I'm, uh, I'm going ahead and I'm bringing on more coaches. I'm buying more equipment. We just knocked down the wall of you know, my warehouse. I'm adding 2,000 square feet. Now, you can't operate at a loss if you don't have the money. But like, let's say you have you know, $50,000 saved up in a checking account, 50,000 in what we call retained earnings, Okay, it's in your business checking, it's there. And then you made 30 grand, but it you cost you 40 because you had just hired some new staff members. So you technically operated at a loss, right? 30 grand in, 40 grand out, you're at a loss of $10,000. And people are like, well, how do people operate without profit? It's because they have retained earnings somewhere in the business, which is where we get into balance sheets, but, but that's not for today. Or that owner is then having to contribute to the loss. I, any of you gym owners that are watching this that have a full-time job and your full-time job acts as a bank. It acts as like UNICEF to your business, just constantly giving it cash when it needs it, right? Like your grandma, when you're a kid and she can throw 20 bucks in your pocket. It's kind of like that. So that's a scenario where, you know, a business might choose to operate at a loss because it can. Um, other reasons uh, Jim might want to operate at a loss is like, there's times where I've had gym owners be like, I've, I haven't paid myself a lot the past five years. I'm paying myself a significant amount and we have the money saved up in reserves. So we're technically going to show a loss every month, 
because I'm paying myself more. I'm taking more out of the profit or I'm increasing my salary. Now, reasons to show a high profit, right? Obvious, duh. Well, I hear high profit's good, Stu. Not necessarily. I mean, it can be, yes. It's nice to have a high profit. But, you know, you show me a gym owner who's like, man, Stu, I just, I haven't been able to recruit the right people. I'm like, yeah, well, you're spending 22% of what you make on payroll. Who the hell's going to work for you for, like, that's not enough money. But, but Stu, we're really profitable. Really cool. What are you doing with that money besides letting it sit in a low interest bearing checking account or savings account? Use that money. So like, you know, I will, in some scenarios, criticize a gym owner and say, why do you care about having high profit if you're still paying your quote unquote full-time coach 23,000 a year? Let's grow up. Let's pay them more. And who cares if you don't have a high profit? What, do we got a dick measuring contest later next month with the other gym owners? No, let's get our people paid right, even if that takes your profit margin down, and get get then, then let you build back up and get back up to it. So there are reasons to have high profit or low profit, right? I told you earlier, I uh, I operate, my gym always ran and I was very proud of my 26% profit margin on about a half a million a year. That was my, that's like, we just rode steady there. When I bought my building, and I now had a real estate company that I wanted to show profit. I gutted my gym's profit margin. I took from 26 and I dropped it down to like two on average. And oftentimes we take a loss because I didn't care anymore about my gym showing profit. I didn't have to prove anything to anybody. I needed my real estate portfolio to show a profit. That's what I cared about at that point. So it was strategic and purposeful. Um, but other reasons to show high profit, any of you guys who want a franchise, you better have your profit margin lined up, ready to go. You cannot be going in to get FTD docs showing losses every month. It's not going to work. Um, if you want to get a lease with what I do with the gym real estate company, like someone comes to me and I have to tell them, hey, what does the PL look like? Because if you're showing me a loss for the last year, well, the landlord's going to ask for this PL and we need to be able to explain this. Sometimes we make a good explanation for it. Other times we can't. So there are reasons. If you're planning on borrowing money from a bank, getting a line of credit, getting an SBA loan, you're going to want to show a profit margin as of high as possible. They're going to look at that and they are going to interpret that as a means of success. And can you pay back this debt? Awesome. So questions, comments, concerns. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, Stu. That was great. Um, yeah. If you guys have any questions, go ahead, drop them in either the Q&A or the, or the chat. Uh, Alex, I, I like that comment. Um, it comes down to how you want to view the expenses and the way that the money is working inside your business. So uh, Alex, in case you guys can't see the, the comment, he said for what it's worth, uh, the list of like meals, entertainment, all that stuff can be classified as operating ex expenses. Uh, I usually teach gym owners to break out their expenses or categorize their expenses by mandatory versus uh, discretionary, as opposed to, yes, they could all be considered operating expenses in the classic accounting terminology, but uh, it's a good exercise for gym owners to look at their P&L stratified, hey, these are the expenses that I have to pay month to month, for instance, in order to keep my doors open versus these are the things that are nice to have or the discretionary expenses that I'm also incurring just to give them an idea if they, there is fat to trim relative to payroll and the mandatory expenses. So uh, Jen, here's a question. Is there a target you recommend, Stu, to keep non-essential expenses at? I, I So I personally have never taken OPEX and broke it into essential and non-essential. Um, I just look at it kind of globally from that. Um, right. But again, if we're thinking of a non-essential expense, again, this gets into the emotional side. Like I will 100% argue that, let's use the games example. I have gym owners that'll drop four to seven grand during that time and they take a couple of their members and, you know, I, I got this person at might go next year. I really want to keep them encouraged. So I'm going to take, I'm like, I don't think that's essential. I think that's, the silliest thing I've ever heard. You should not, if, if you're financially hurting, right? If you're great, then, you know, blow it and it doesn't matter. What's an essential expense? Like, well, rent is essential. Yep. Payroll is essential, yep. right? I mean, like, so it's like, what's essential? Is push press essential? I mean, yeah. you got to do, I mean, you could go pen and paper. That would suck. You could go Excel sheet. That would suck. 
But I mean, is it like, what's the difference? I guess we just have to define what essential versus not essential is. And then that seems like an emotional conversation that I personally uh, would not want to have with a, with another owner to then debate what's essential or non-essential. Yeah. And it's really up to, that's a great point. It is an emotional um, conversation to have either with the gym owner or ideally with yourself so that you can see, Hey, is, is, am I keeping my spending in line? Because when we look at the PL outside, outside um, parties, banks, lenders, uh, other other mentors, even or anybody that you're sharing that information with, they're probably just going to want to see the straight expense list. But for a gym owner, I would say that the exercise of looking at your PL month over month is to control the emotional spending, part in part. Right. And to get an objective view of your business. Hey, these are the things I'm spending my money on. So it's just uh, one of the things that I've suggested to business owners as they organize their PL in order to get a um, a less biased through their own lens view of what they're spending their money on. A couple other questions we got. Uh, Karen is asking, we get a deposit from Stripe on the bank account, but it's not broken down by. PT group classes, it's not categorized by the service type, it seems. Should I look at the push press report and break down the deposit using tags to differentiate? And on the PL, I'm guessing. Well, so want? a few, so a few things on that. So if your gym, let's say your membership recurring EFT is consistent, we draft on the first and the 15th. That gets pretty easy to track. That's now if you're a gym that does like drips throughout the month, like we take little bits and you know, you know, you might draft on the first and 15th, but on the sixth, you sold three new clients. And then on the 12th, you sold two more clients. And then on the 22nd, Tina bought a 10 pack punch card, whatever. Um, those independent things going in, you, you know, again, if you identify, I don't know what push press can do on this as far as like a sales report, but the right. date should be universal and the amount should be universal. The only thing that gets tricky now is when you have a payment processor and I'm assuming we're talking about Stripe. If I take a hundred dollars from someone's checking account from within push press, but through Stripe, what comes into my checking account? Is it a hundred dollars? Right. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so then that should be easy to identify. Now, some payment processors, it's the hundred dollars minus the transaction cost. Right. Some yep. payment processors batch transaction costs at the end of the month or whatever cadence they do. Yep. So that's a that's a great point. That's going to be pretty specific to the individual um, scenario and the context. I'll let you guys know what we did was we, and I, I think I brought this up to you when we were initially talking about this uh, webinar, Stu. I put the credit card transaction fees in the category of cost of goods sold because every single transaction that I went through at the gym, we didn't do cash. We didn't do anything other than, than credit cards. Um, so, or debit card it was the same type of expense. Uh, so there is also a delay to take into consideration. If you are trying to line up your sales report and push press with your, uh, revenue report from your bank account or in QuickBooks or in zero, right? There is a slight delay, probably a day to three days of when you've made the sale in push press versus when it gets deposited in your bank account. Now, this is an issue at the end of the month if you're looking at the previous month's um, accounting. So essentially what you would have is, let's say you had transactions go on the 29th, 30th and 31st, they didn't post, they, they're going to pop up in your sales report for that given month in push press, but they're going to look, they're going to count as the following month's revenue in QuickBooks because they didn't get deposited into your account until a few days later. So there is some reconciliation that needs to happen with that. You could bother with it or not bother with it. As long as you're consistent, that's going to be the biggest issue. Would you agree with that, Stu? Or how would you approach that situation? No, I, I would. And I, I think, you know, mainly because I think what you're talking about, a couple of the other questions here, kind of essentially wanting to, when I w talk about the tagging, right? How oh, to yeah. like, am I tagging it in QuickBooks, tagging or whatever? I, I think if you can, I tag the identity, you know, the things, but unfortunately on a, on, on, let's say what's today, August 1st today, if you right. had a, tr if you stripe, drop money into your account today, that could be a batch of 
10 waters you've sold that day, two new memberships, and you also process a new personal training. It's all batched in the one. Yep. So it, it can be hard there. Now, I am not familiar with the ability to tag items in Stripe as they come in, or if on push press side, you can associate uh, like, uh, what do you like out of income categories and see that on, uh, the, um, the stripe side. So yep. I'm not familiar with that. Um, at the end of the day though, I'm pretty sure push press is as most member management softwares do. You're going to be able to go ahead and just see you did 10,000 this month. This percentage came from this revenue category you created. This percentage came from this rev revenue category you created and this, and, and that's helpful. Um, yeah, yeah so I mean, Karen, that's how I would approach it is I would have your um, your monthly PL from QuickBooks or Zero, whatever accounting software that you have, alongside your monthly sales document from PushPress that breaks out the sales by category. And those numbers should line up minus the couple days of uh, transactions at the end of the month. So if you build $20,000 in the month of July, cool, your sales report from PushPress should say $20,000 and it should have a breakdown of the category, I would look at it that way, right next to it. That way you have a, uh, a drilled down view of where your revenue came from, as opposed to having to constantly uh, break out that batch payment in QuickBooks. Just let push press, just pull it from push press. Uh, so Nathan asked, what is the easiest way to see monthly totals of sold PTs through appointments? Um, is there a way to see totals of average? This is a question for the push press software. We, Nathan, just so you're aware, we are revamping the reporting and all of the things that you are asking right there is coming down the pipeline here within the next quarter, ideally. Um, we are, you should be able to get all that information and more uh, through push press reporting. If you need help with a specific metric or data point, the intercom button in the bottom right-hand corner of your core dashboard will take you to a, a rep who's going to walk you through all that stuff and pull all that information for you. Stu, so I have a quick question. No problem, Nathan. I have a quick question. Is there a, I think we were talking yesterday about ratios when it came to um, OPEX, payroll versus revenue. What are some best practices that you would suggest or, or ask gym owners to employ in order to make sure that their p l is organized and then from a from a top-down view just looks generally healthy yeah so um i actually let me go ahead and see if i can pull this up for you guys and show you and this will actually be probably the the best way for me to do it for you but um now let, let me ask you this as a as a second question to that in this hypothetical scenario are we looking at like, is this a gym that is, uh, it's like established. Is it looking to borrow money in the future from someone? Or is it like, no, I'm not planning on borrowing any money. I have no reason to have to show profit. Cause again, the, the, the profit is, is again, it, I saw it here. It could be a vehicle for growth. Yep. Well, if you're growing with it, you're spending it probably on staff or, you know, space, which goes in the OPEX. So it, but you only show the retained profit when you need a, someone who's giving you cash to feel good about them, to feel good about you. So in that Correct. scenario, is this business looking to borrow money in the future from no. a lender of any type? No. Okay. No. All right. So let me see if I got this for you guys. And this will maybe make this very, very helpful. Um, I kind of do this in a couple of ways. I kind of break it down based on revenue over time. Um, boop, boop, boop. Cool. There we go. I'm going to do another screen share. And this question is probably going to Zach's to be pinging me after. It's like, okay, Stu, we have a new course for push start that I need you to pop out. Um, all right. So if your total monthly revenue is around 25 or under, what I generally recommend is around profit of about 10%. Show some profit in the beginning. Now, this is also a scenario. If you came in highly undercapitalized and you're still bootstrapping, and we all know this, like every month I have to buy a little bit more equipment because I only had enough for seven barbells when I started, that would change this, Right. But if you came in capitalized, you're not growing as you grow with like equipment and stuff. Um, I would keep it there. Owner pay. So in distributions, not salary, 20. Payroll at 20. OPEX at 45. Tax at five. That's generally, and again, this is not advice for any of you. This is just 
generally where I would most see most gyms fall at around 25 and under. When we get up to around 35, we change things a little bit. Profit 12, owner pay 16, payroll 26, OPEX 40, tax six. When I get someone up to 50, because these seem to be kind of the milestones, a lot of gyms will get from here to here. And then there's a sticking point between 35 and 50. Okay. Yep. Big sticking point. Um, and this is then where, you know, then we just bump the profit. You'd see profit is bumping up. So in none of these scenarios have I accounted for a gym in which they're like, I'm not planning on borrowing any money in the future. I'm going to gut the cash out of this thing and reinvest it into what would be payroll, OPEX, or my own owner pay. Okay. Um, and you can see like the owner pay here, like in this example, like I'm doing 50 grand a year and I'm only paying myself $7,000 in owner pay a month. Well, hey, that's not bad, but you could also be paying yourself part of that payroll as well. Like most people that are, especially if you classify as um, an S corp, you're going to have somewhat of a, a decent small salary and then have distributions. But this is kind of the breakdown of how I look at it. If any of you guys are screenshotting this, go for it. Um, this is my, the general breakdown. Again, not advice for anybody, just typically what I would see at those markers of total monthly revenue. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that, Stu. Uh, if there are any more questions, put it in there. One thing I do want to announce is that there is a new push start course and uh, I am going to actually link it for you guys in the chat. I just realized I want to give you guys access to this directly. This is a new push start course from Stu on how to evaluate your PL. So now that you have the basic understanding of what a PL is, how to organize it, and um, what information it's giving you, this course is going to take you through how to take that information and understand what you can do with it. Basically, uh, Stu, you actually designed the course. I don't know why I'm talking about when you could actually just tell them <laughs> what what it is. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go through some of it. You'll see a little bit of a review of what we did today. But then we're essentially just going to go, it's a much deeper dive uh, than what the, the webinar allows um, on evaluating a PL. okay? What to be looking at, what to be thinking of when you look at these numbers, because every PL is simply telling you a story. You made this much, but it cost you this much to make it. That's why the, more, the most sophisticated gyms that I have a chance to work with, it's not that they're constantly like, more revenue, more revenue, more revenue. All they think about is, okay, making 60K a month isn't bad but it's costing me too much to make it. How do I lean out and make my system more efficient? And that's that's where, you know, I think a lot of the sophistication in the stages of business, um, you know, you have, you know, infancy, maturity, sophistication, decline, or in innovation, it, where it comes in is in, be is not spending as much. Because let me ask you this, are you oh, in charge sure. of how much revenue you make? Nope, you're not. You can know none of you are in charge of how much revenue you'll make this month. You can influence it and you can guesstimate it, but you can't make it happen. But I 100% can cancel your cable bill today if I wanted to lower your operating expenses by $65 a month. I could cancel the 15 1099 SaaS products that you have if I wanted to lower your OPEX by that amount. The only thing you can control is how much you spend because you right. voluntarily move that money, right? So, you know, uh, and it's always SaaS products that end up being the thing that every gym owner is like, oh shit, I didn't realize I, realized, I was spending I had 10 subscriptions. Yeah. 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 And that's that to your point, that is exactly why I have gym owners as an exercise break out to operating, non-operating and payroll is because of what you just said right there. So that's phenomenal. Um, guys, we're going to wrap up about 13 minutes early. Uh, from the hour, I am really appreciative of everybody that came out. If you have any questions at all, you can always hit me up at Zach at pushpress.com. I put my email in and Stu put his email out there. Reach out to us with any specific questions you have on any of this stuff. And we're more than happy to help you. Um, we are completely here for you. If you need help signing up for a push start or, or getting into that platform, same exact thing, hit me up and I'll take you through it. Uh, if there's anything else that you want to say, Stu. Are you good? Nope. nope. That guys, that is it. If you have anything, my email's down there. Always down to answer questions. All right. I'm going to head off and download an album by Run the Jewels. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. See yeah. you guys.
All right. Later, everyone. Thanks again.